Let us pray. Lord, open our eyes and ears that we may hear your word that you have prepared for this community today. Amen. Matthew 22, verses 1 through 14. Jesus spoke to them in, ga- in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened cattle have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they said, paid no attention and went off, one to the field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to the servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. So go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out onto the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot, throw him outside into the darkness, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. The Gospel of the Lord. Well, I wish you could see my wife, Jill, get ready for a big party. The planning starts days, if not weeks, in advance. The plates that serve the food and those doohickeys that hold them up, they all have to be specially selected and arranged. There's the dining room area, and then there's the living room area, and then there's the kitchen and the the little uh, dining nook that everything has to have just the right look and touch and feel. The spacing of the drink offerings matters so there's the right flow of people. The light and the music are important elements because the party's as much about ambiance as content. But the preparation is of no value if the guests don't show up. So, Have I just lost my microphone? No, okay. So, the preparations are of no value if the guests don't show up, right? Say the party's supposed to start at 6 o'clock. We're dressed, of course, ready to go, and we're waiting for guests. So now it's 6 o'clock, and I say in my calm, reassuring voice, I guess no one's coming to your party. True story. The story Jesus tells today is a parable, but it's a true story. It illustrates what the kingdom of God is like. The kingdom experience, Jesus tells us, is like a wedding feast which is hosted by a king, and we should understand this king to be God in this story. The king is hosting this wedding party for his son, who we understand to be Jesus. And the king has a desire that this will be a party that will be talked about forever, literally. The king is ordered that at this party, only the finest wines, the richest desserts, will be surrounded by the freshest fruits and vegetable offerings, and the main course is going to be the juiciest meats with goodness just like dripping down your chin at every bite. The king's court musicians practice special songs for weeks and brand new linens are ordered to cover all of the surfaces. And so then the invitations go out. Come to the party. Come to the wedding feast. But with a week to go, the king had received back none of those little cards that say whether the invited guests will attend. He asked for an RSVP and he got Nothing. You see, their mailboxes were just too full. Their mailboxes were so full that they missed the invitation altogether. So how about your life? 
is the mailbox just too full for you to see God's invitation to you this week? It's a hard thing when that mailbox doesn't get looked at to eventually look at any of it. Well, I'll just toss the whole thing and start over. You have so much going on in your life that you've stopped to look at the mail that God is sending you this week. You know, God keeps sending invitations. God keeps saying, here, read this, read this, read my invitation. Read about the party I'm having. Oh boy, I'm really busy, God. Sorry. Are you missing the one invitation that would be the event of a lifetime because you're too busy to open God's letter? You see, the danger in our busy lives is that even if we don't want to say no to God's invitation to joy, we just never get around to saying yes. I mean, it's not like we want to say no to God. It's not like, well, if we knew we had been invited, it's not like we want to say no. We just don't get around to saying yes. We're doing everything at the expense of doing the one thing. We fill our lives with so many commitments and the fingers are all pointing. You can all point your finger at me. I know that I am the guy I'm preaching about right now. But maybe you are too. We fill our lives with so many commitments that it becomes impossible to say yes to the invitation to the feast. Our feet and head hurt so much by the end of the week that we decide it would be better just to stay home, put our feet up, than to participate in the one experience which would change our lives. But the good news is this. The king really wants people at the party. So he extends another invitation. Today it would be like the host calling the guest list. So saying something like this, you know, these people calling up telephone banks. Say, the king sent you this invitation. Hi. Well, the king wants you to know it's going to be a really spectacular party, best food you ever had, best drink you ever had. Won't you please come to the banquet? God is persistent in his invitation. God sent the prophets for thousands of years to tell people that he wanted to be their God, and he wanted the people to be his people. God says that to you today. I want to be your God. I want you to be my people. This week, I would like to you to know that you are my people. And so God keeps sending these invitations. Time after time, though, the people hear the prophet and they say no. So God sends his own son to call on us. And still people say no. In fact, people don't say no. They kill Jesus. They kill Jesus. How do we kill Jesus, I wonder? Indifference to the divine invitation has been an issue apparently forever, or Jesus wouldn't have bothered to tell this story. How many of us know that God invites us to participate in the joy of knowing God more deeply, we know that that's the truth, right? But our answer so often is, I'll get back to you, God. You know, I would really like to participate in the party. Thanks for the call. Let me check my calendar, God. I'll get back to you. Really, I will. And then, well, we forget. Well, others, of course, are just outright hostile to the call. They hang up on the caller, shouting expletives at the messenger. In fact, sometimes they still kill the messenger. If you follow the news. But the thing about God is this. There is so much food, it's going to spoil. There's so much wine that isn't going to taste good after the bottle's been open for so long. God's party is going to happen. The feast must be eaten. The divine dance must be danced. The heavenly music must be played. 
So the divine invitation goes out to each of you and to me. Divine patience waits for your answer. But you can't read this story without being a little troubled, right? I mean, those were some hard words. And I think the point of the hard words is this. If you are indifferent to the invitation, if you destroy the messenger, either way, your no does not meet with divine indifference. There is a divine invitation. There is divine patience for you to say yes, but if ultimately you say no, if ultimately the world says no, God is not indifferent. It makes a difference to God how you answer, that you answer, because the feast must be eaten. God's party will happen. Someone is going to enjoy the food and drink. The divine dance music must be played to a full house. So, the third invitation goes out. And this time, the king says, this isn't working. We send letters, nobody writes back. We call the hang up. Go out to the corner, and you hand them invitations. In fact, bring them back, anybody you can find. The time has come now where we can't do any of these other social media techniques. You go get them physically, the good old-fashioned way of extending an invitation. Come with me. And the king gets his full house. The king gets his full house. We're told that they bring everyone. They bring the good. And then they bring the bad. Wait a minute. They bring the good and they bring the bad. That's Tammy. I told her I wanted a picture of the good and the, the bad. I d well, of course, Tammy said, how am I supposed to find good and bad? Who are they? And we talked about it. Well, I don't know. Who are the? You figure it out. I just give you the ideas. So she said, well, aren't we really all the good and the bad? You can thank her for this point if you like it, because it's her idea. You see, I don't know which group you thought you were in. When you heard that, when you heard that read, and you heard that the bad and the good were brought. Who did you think? What group did you put yourself in? That's a really hard question, isn't it? I mean, maybe today you're feeling like, oh, I'm probably one of the bad. Maybe other days you're one of the good. You see, the point is we're, we're all both. We're all both, but God loves us anyway. God says, look, I don't know if you think you're bad. I don't know if you think you're good. The point is, come to the party. That's what Jesus is saying. Come to the party. That's the point of God's grace. God loves you, the good part, the bad part. Come just as you are to the feast. There's going to be a party, and by God's gracious invitation, we all can be there. The hall is going to be filled, friends. The hall is going to be filled with the finest regal wear. We're going to be there in this great way. And so the hall is filled, right? The hall is filled with people in these beautiful gowns and these great tuxes, and they're filling the place because God wants it to be filled. And that, what one commentator says, the most comforting verse in this whole story is, is verse 10 where he says, listen to what he says. He says, when he gets to this part, he's describing the banquet, and he says, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. You see, God is going to find enough people who say yes to fill the hall. And that can be you. That can be your family. That can be your friends. That can be the world. Because God calls everybody, and I mean everybody, is invited 
to the banquet. But not everybody says yes. Why do we practice hospitality at Hope Church? Why do we have the Hope Cafe? Because you like to eat. That's not why we have the Hope Cafe. We have the Hope Cafe. We have coffee and conversation. We have fir com uh, the first Hope community meal. We have the talent show. We have the Christmas brunch. We have the Easter brunch. We have all of this stuff going on. When, you, uh, when the women have their groups that meet together, there's food, right? We practice hospitality because we're practicing. We're practicing to receive God's hospitality. This is what it's going to be like for us. This is what it's like it can be for us now. It's all free. I mean, if you went to a wedding banquet, if you went to a wedding banquet and you had this great meal and then the servers came around and handed you a bill, well, you can see the wedding couple slinking under the table as they look at the host and the host says, well, I paid for the place. You know, they can at least pay for the food. That would be shocking. It would be unheard of. Why are wedding banquets free? Because we're modeling God's wedding banquet. Where it's all free. Why, is all, why are all of the hospitality events at Hope Church free? Because we're modeling God's hospitality. You want to help pay for it? Bring an offering. But it's free. It's free. God's wedding banquet is free. But then there's this troubling end to the story. The king comes in and he sees all these people... And out of all this group, he spots one person who doesn't have on wedding clothes. Now, this isn't a story about a guy who, you know, shows up in some schluppy hoodie. No, it's a guy who shows up in his best stuff. He's got this $1,000 Armani suit on. He's got his Gucci loafers. He looks good, right? How could the king even spot him? He doesn't have on the wedding clothes. I think what this part of the story is about is this. If you think you can come to the wedding banquet on your own, that you've lived a really good life, that you don't really need Jesus to get you there, because look at what I've done. Jesus is saying it doesn't work that way. You can be all dressed up, but if you don't have on what God says you need to have on, the clothes of Jesus Christ, you're not going to be welcome. There's not a place for those who think they can get there on their own. It is by grace alone that we have been saved. Let me try this illustration. You know these robes, right? These are these robes that you can get in the fancy hotels. They're these warm, soft, cushy robes. They're laid out for you, or, or they're in the closet. And, and then you can get them, and, and you look at them, and you think, if you're like me, well, I could put it on, but probably they're going to know. And probably they're going to charge me $100 for wearing this. It's some plot. And you could steal it, of course. I mean, borrow it. Well, take it home. And they're going to just send you a $100 bill anyway. So I figure, forget it. I'm just going to use the little towel. But that's not what it's like with God. God says, hey, come on into the room. Get ready for the banquet. I've got these warm, soft, cushy robes laid out for you on the bed as you enter. And they are free. You can look around. You won't find a price tag. You won't find a little note hidden somewhere in the door. By the way, if you use this, it's going to cost you money. It's free. It's free. You can call the front desk to double check, and St. Peter's going to say, yeah, it's really free. The robe is free. And so it will be at the great wedding feast of our Lord. We will be gathered around in the righteous robes of Christ, young and old. Young and old will gather around this table. There will be people from all families and children and sizes. There will be people of all colors who have gathered around, who have gathered around this table. There will be singing. There will be dancing. There will be walking along and enjoying God's kingdom. So, 
the invitation goes out to you today. And it says grace. Friends, don't let this get lost in the busyness of your life. This week, make time to read the mail. And then fill out the little card. You do that by praying to God. And say yes, won't you? Won't you fill out the card? And to our Lord, you are invited to RSVP with a yes. Say yes to God. And do so, my friends, do so with gratitude. Because it is our call to receive the invitation, to respond to the invitation with a great yes, and to do so with gratitude, because that's how we say thank you to God. Put on the robes of Christ, serve the King. Well, you know, eventually people come to Jill's party. And a great time is had by all who show up. Those who don't show up, we miss them. But they don't know what they miss. Don't forget to say yes. And to show up for God's wedding feast. You can ignore it. You will be missed but you won't know what you missed. RSVP. Please. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you've given us this divine invitation. You've waited for us with divine patience. You've delivered it with divine persistence. Give us the courage to say yes so that we are not subject to divine judgment. For you, we know there is no such thing as divine indifference toward your people. Make us the yes people you have called us to be. Amen.